Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, thank you so much. Um, when I first came to Anji and I saw the children playing and I heard Mrs. Chung speak and I heard the principals and teachers speak, my first reaction was a selfish one. Um, I wanted to go to school here. Um, I wanted, I wish my child could have gone to school here. I, I wish my granddaughter could go to school here. Um, but my next reaction was less selfish. Um, I really saw that this is something that, that the whole world needs. Um, and how can I be part of this effort to bring true play to the world? Um, I added true play to my list of the fundamental needs of children. Um, the need to be loved, to be held, to be listened to and respected, um, and now true play also. But we can't just announce the needs of children. Um, for children to have all their needs met, we need a transformation. A transformation in the world, in families, in educational systems, in the culture. Um, I don't have any slides, I don't have any data, um, uh, I don't have any videos of Anji, I want to offer something different. Um, I want to take the five core Anji principles, love, risk, joy, engagement, reflection, and see if we can help understand each of those from the inside. A transformation in the world requires an inner transformation. Um, let's start with love. Um, of course we start with love. Um, on my first visit to Anji, I heard Mrs. Chung um, say, uh, I'll, I have to paraphrase it, but she said something like, um, a lot of problems are not really problems if you remember that the first principle is love always. Um, I think of love, when I think about love, I think about the connection between people. And the metaphor I often use for connection is a tower. If you imagine two children on top of one of these boxes, um, or on top of the ladders, um, here we are together on top of the world. Uh, the world is full of possibilities because we're here together, we're connected. This tower of connection is built of respect, uh, tuning into one another. Um, when it's an adult and a child especially, the tower of connection means I'll meet your needs. Um, first your need for security and then your need for exploration. Unfortunately, towers fall apart, Discon disconnection happens, you end up with a pile of stones, a pile of uh, materials instead of a tower. Um, disconnection is inevitable, we can't avoid it. It happens when there are separations, it happens um, when there's anger and frustration, disappointment. Um, unfortunately, a lot of disconnection happens in families and in schools when adults don't see children as they are. Instead, we see children uh, compared to our expectations and we see a failure instead of a child. But the failure is actually the, uh, the way that our expectations are not rich enough to meet the reality of, of childhood. Fortunately, all the stones that fell apart from the tower can be rebuilt into a bridge. Uh, this is reconnection. We reconnect by playing together, by listening to one another, by finding each other again. The bridge is a, is a metaphor that I like because either person can take the first step to reconnecting. Um, for the parents out there, have you ever had a disconnection with your child and you're not ready to reconnect yet, but they're ready to reconnect? This is a very common experience. Um, so uh, I'd like this to um, just together experience this connection, disconnection, reconnection by just turning to the person next to you and make some kind of connection with them. Maybe a hello, handshake, bow, introduce yourself. Don't get carried away. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, and I'm glad. And now here's a challenging instruction. Disconnect from that person. Some of you don't want to. Just try it. Disconnect.
And now uh, you can reconnect with them. So even though we're playing and it's just an exercise, I'm sure some of you felt the pleasure of connection and the pain of disconnection and the relief of reconnection. Yes, I know. I saw your slides. <laughs> um, so turning to risk, um, one thing I want to say about risk is that safety and risk are not opposites. We need to feel secure in order to take risks. Um, so I need two volunteers for this next exercise. Can I get a okay. Um, your job is to get that ladder over there and stand over there next to David with the ladder. Yep, the one that's leaning against. And I need another volunteer to come up and be here with me. Okay. And your job is to pretend to be afraid of ladders. Okay. <laughs> okay. So just hold the ladder so she can see it. And, and, I, and your job out there is to do two things. One is to have some empathy and support for her in her facing her fear. And the other is to imagine what it would be like to be somebody who's afraid of ladders and there's a ladder over there. Yeah, so we're going to walk towards it together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> together, she really understood that part. Together. And we're going to go slowly because often when we're facing a fear, if we have to, if we can't avoid it, we just want to get it over with. But you don't really work through the feelings that way. So we're going to go slowly. So I just want to check in with you. I like, to ask, I like to ask children when they're afraid, not what is your feeling, because emotions are bigger than words. We tell, we tell kids, use your words, but emotions are beyond words. So I like to ask, like from one to 10, what's your number? One is, ah, and 10 is, ah. I'm feeling nine. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK, so maybe we should back up a step. Ah, and take some deep breaths. Okay, you ready? <laughs> so the goal is not to get to the ladder <coughs> or for her to climb the ladder. The goal is for her to experience my support, your support, while she's facing this thing that she's afraid of. Yeah. Ah. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to just, uh, we could do this all day, uh, but we have some other concepts to get through. Um, so just, so thank you very much. Thank you, Jody. Um, as parents and as educators, we worry a lot. Um, we worry because we care so much and we, um, we don't remember that worry doesn't help um, with all the things that we're worried about. Um, it's important to remember that the, for us as, as parents, as educators, the opposite of worry is not calm serenity. We don't really get calm serenity. Now, Buddhist monks have calm serenity, but they don't have children. <laughs> um, and they get to meditate for hours a day. So the rest of us, the opposite of worry is trust. Trust in the power of development. Trust in relationships. Trust in the resilience of children. Um, when my daughter was uh, little, she was kindergarten age, and she was climbing, and I was standing underneath 
saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. And my friend came over and said, you know, Larry, she's going to recover better from a broken arm than from being timid and fearful her whole life. And I really had to acknowledge the truth of that. And my friend very nicely didn't say, she'll recover better from a broken arm than from being timid and fearful her whole life, like you, Larry. Um, so that helped me be able to take in the feedback. And I realized I didn't want her to have that worried, anxious uh, life like I had um, always struggled with. Um, I wanted her to be confident. And you don't get confidence from, be careful, be careful, don't do that. Um, so I really took that to heart. Um, the next principle is joy. So I have another game for you. And I apologize that these games are false play, because I'm telling you what the rules of the game are. But we're on a path from no play to false play to true play. I guess I could have said, for my time, let's play and see what happens. But I wasn't brave enough to do that. <laughs> so we'll have some false play to get us started. Um, so stand up, if you will. And we're all going to fake yawn. Ah. <laughs> and the yawning is not exactly an emotion, but it relieves tension. And this is one of the purposes of emotion, is to relieve tension. And now we'll fake laugh together. <laughs> <laughs> And a fake laugh often brings a real laugh. I think that's because um, young children laugh about 300 times a day, but I don't think any of us laugh 300 times a day. We have backed up laughter that we haven't finished, so. <laughs> okay, let's do scared. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna teach you a better way to do scared than that. <laughs> You go up with your body and your voice and then down with your body and your voice. So it's, you have to do it with me. It's very embarrassing otherwise. <laughs> we often tell children and we tell ourselves, don't show your feelings, don't do that. There's nothing to be scared of, but actually getting them out is better. Okay. <laughs> Arr. Okay, I knew that would be a hard one. Let's do that one again. Arr. Okay, sit down. <laughs> so, we're talking about joy. How come I did this game with fear and sadness and anger? Um, it's because you can't have joy if your other emotions are blocked. Um, it just biologically, if you block emotions, you block all the emotions. Um, and so there's no room for joy. The idea of just be happy all the time, it's just life is not like that, our biology is not like that. Um, I was thinking about this while I was writing my remarks, and I realized that suppressing emotion is like false play. Suppressing emotion blocks a natural process for the sake of an adult agenda. Blocking emotion goes against human biology, just like blocking play goes against the human biology of childhood. Um, on a visit to an Anji school, I saw two boys, and there was a, they were in front of the big TV screen, which was turned off, and so it was like a mirror, and they were doing all this punching in front of the mirror, watching themselves in the mirror. And I wondered what the teacher would do seeing this, and the teacher went over and joined in in the punching. And the children were delighted. And um, a lot of people would worry that the message of the teacher is it's okay to hit, it's okay to be violent. But that's not the message. The message this teacher was giving the boys was, I see you. Um, I welcome all of you. What the boys felt, I think, was I'm seen. I'm okay. I'm powerful in my play. This makes you not have to hit anyone if you're powerful in this way. Um, engagement. Um, the last game I want to teach um, is I teach this to parents and teachers and children as a way to practice tuning in with one another. 
um, and tuning in with yourself. And tuning in is a key part of engaging in the world. And one of the most interesting things about the world is other people. And to be with other people in an engaged way, you have to tune in with them. Um, so I need two volunteers for this. Okay, come on up. Okay, come on up. Hi. Hi. Hello. So uh, we're going to watch them do a series of games, and then we're gonna, all going to stand up and do it together. So um, stand close together so that your hands can be almost touching. So I call this force field hands because I watched a lot of Star Trek when I was a boy. <laughs> so is an energy field between you and do you feel anything? I feel energy. energy yeah. uh, I feel nervous. Nervous? Yeah. <laughs> Good. So this is the force field between you and now I want you to push his hands backwards using only the energy field between you. So you feel that push and your hands go back because you're getting pushed back without touching. And maybe you feel that energy a little stronger. And now you push her back using only the energy field between you. Okay, let, him, let his hands push you back. Let that energy field push you back. Good. <laughs> <laughs> It's fun to tune in to someone. <laughs> so the next step, you touch hands lightly, and you gradually increase the pressure that you're pushing, but you're matching the other person's pressure exactly. So after a few seconds, you're pushing hard, but nobody's going anywhere, because you're each matching the other, and you're not even sure who's pushing and who's responding. A little harder. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so look at this discovery about yourself and your body, um, the other person. And now, last step, we're going to add this a little element of competition. Okay. See if you can get the other person back a step. <laughs> oh, wow. Evenly matched. Okay, good, thanks. So everybody stand up and find a partner. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you can okay, you first, remember? you're not touching. Liz, <laughs> come do it with me up here. First, you're not touching. And you notice what you feel. Then you push. One person pushes using the energy field between you. And then you push back. You can try that a couple times. All right, then you touch hands. Get in a strong position and you gradually increase the push. Increase the push, but matching exactly. So nobody goes anywhere. <laughs> you're pushing really hard, but nobody's going anywhere because you're so tuned in and you're matching so exactly. And now look out behind you and look behind your partner and add a little competition, but don't knock anybody over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. You can sit Not down. This open mic. That was fun. Thank you. <clears throat> it is. And just what you need. If you play this with your children, they might want to skip the first step and go right to the competition. That's fine. <laughs> If they get so excited pushing hands that they start punching, you can each have a pillow and you can push my pillow against your pillow. Um, 
The last principle is reflection. Um, there's uh, a common emotion when, when people come to Anji for the first time um, or repeated times, which is a great joy and sometimes mixed with a great sadness. Um, and sometimes mixed with the fear, oh no, a child is away. Um, so we can have a lot of emotions. And these emotions come from deep within us. Um, and these emotions that arise within us demand reflection. They demand that we look at our childhoods and think, what was my early childhood like? Did I get to play like this? Um, did, was I trusted in this way? Was I seen in this way? Um, and so a big part of our reflection as adults is uh, Mrs. Chung's core question to all of us, which is, what are your deepest, earliest memories of play? But also, I would add, what do you find when you look inside about your childhood? What do you want to keep? What do you just as soon leave aside? What do you need to rebuild because you don't have enough of that? Um, in addition, I want to invite your reflection on leadership. Um, trusting and following children does not mean that we give up our adult leadership roles. Parents need to be leaders in their families. Teachers and administrators and policymakers, we're all leading. Um, one area that we uh, have a shared project together here is to lead the world in uh, valuing play, valuing true play. Um, and there's an example of adult leadership that I want to share that comes from an Anji school. And it's a story I heard from a principal of an Anji kindergarten on my first visit. Um, there was a boy <clears throat> in a classroom and he had uh, trouble speaking. He had very limited uh, language ability. And as is usual, when that's the situation, he was very frustrated. And because of the frustration, he would sometimes hit other children. And um, the response at, at his school was more playtime. Some people visit an Anji school and you think, there's so much playtime. Well, the intervention for this child was, let's have even more playtime. He couldn't relax and rest during rest time, and so um, some adults who were free during rest time would play with him one-on-one -on -one, um, out on the playground during rest time. He, um, his ability to play with others increased, his ability to speak increased dramatically, um, but he still had some trouble with his peers. He still, I lost my pages, um, he still um, hit sometimes. <clears throat> so many of the parents complained. They told the school, they told the, the principal, we don't want our child in that boy's class. We don't want that boy in our child's class. And the teacher wrote a letter home to all the parents. Um, with the support of the principal. And the teacher's letter said, because of this child in your class, your children are lucky. They have more opportunities to learn. They have unique opportunity to practice acceptance and compassion and the embrace of others. This will be a very, very valuable lesson for them in their lives. They are lucky, you are lucky. And the parents shifted their attitude. And the children took the lead of their parents and their teachers. And they treated this boy with compassion and acceptance. And uh, as a result, his development accelerated and his ability to be social accelerated. And by second grade, he was fully integrated with his peers and caught up with his peers academically. So uh, what, what I take from this story is that we can't separate following and respecting children from taking powerful leadership as adults. We care about children, um, and uh, these are both ways to show it, to follow them, let them play, observe their play, and to take leadership in this way. So I hoped in this um, few minutes that I've helped you um, to feel inside why true play is so valuable for human development 
and why it's so good for the world. Thank you.